Thank you all for, for sticking it out. I don't know about I don't know about y'all, but after one of these, I I've gone home, you know, and had my wife go, "Okay, well, tell me all about the conference," and I'm like, uh. and I, literally, it's like, "Give me till Wednesday." It takes me a couple days to process everything, and then I'll just start talking, you know. Um, so I know how it is, but it's fantastic to get this much information all at once. Now, the final speaker of our conference this year, I think this is a perfect way. Uh, to end this conference in this time because it's about um, basically how this phenomenon has changed. And what I'm, I'm talking about the abduction portion of this phenomenon. If you've been in this field for a while, even if you just had a mild interest for years, you'll know that back you know, in the beginning days of the abduction phenomenon, we were doing a lot of work trying to find out what the aliens look like, what their uniforms look like, the little tools they poked us with and all that kind of stuff. And so there, it was a lot of information gathering, but it was very superficial, really. Um, as that progressed, now we're trying to learn more, like, what they're up to. Well, we're also now going past that, okay? And the understanding of this phenomenon has to keep expanding, and uh, we're getting to, a, I think, a very interesting and a very cool place with it. And our, our, our final speaker uh, of the conference is going to um, touch on this very powerfully. Uh, she lives in the lush hills of southwest Wisconsin and winters in Arizona. Nice gig. Okay. I don't know if I want her life or Tom's life, the photography guy. Yeah. All right. Uh, her life has been an adventure of discovery as the truth about her secret life as a volunteer um, comes more and more into focus. In 1989, the Center for UFO Studies investigated her missing time episode and after extensive research, concluded that she was the victim of alien abductions. And that literally would be the way we put it back in that day. Okay. Um, it was determined that this was not just a single event, but had been an ongoing phenomenon. Um, what's more, the contacts continue to this day. The impact that these encounters have had on her life is beyond measure. Um, today she will share with you the reasons why she rejected the label of abductee, and embrace the term coined by the late, great Dolores Cannon, that of volunteer. Now we're getting to the meat of this, aren't we? Okay. Um, she will speak candidly about her interactions with the ETs, she refers to as her guys, and uh, relates uh, the coping mechanisms that she used to live with one foot in this world and one in theirs. Please welcome Sherry Wilde. Good morning, and thank you all for sticking around for the last speaker. I'm very grateful to be here, and I thank Julia for allowing me to come back. She said I could come back if I talked about something different. Didn't give the, <laughs> didn't give the same speech, so I said, okay. So um, I'm going to talk about why um, I believe myself to be a volunteer, and I'm going to talk about my life a little bit. That was hard for me to make that decision. I had to be really pushed to do this. My guys pushed me. I tried to back out. Um, Julia doesn't know that. <laughs> but I tried to back out. I didn't really want to um, get up here and talk about my life. But I think that if it helps or benefits anyone who's struggling with these kinds of experiences, if you believe yourself to be an abductee or if you have had abduction experiences, um, I'm going to invite you to, to look at it from a different perspective. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do a disclaimer first, actually. These are um, my conclusions based on my analysis of my experiences. So there's no scientific data here. I mean, the Center for UFO Studies did um, study quite thoroughly my missing time episode but, and concluded that what I had experienced was an alien abduction. But I'm just going to tell you that I have done my own research on this. I mean, I'm the one having the contact. And I'm the one who knows what they're saying to me and what I'm experiencing. At least once I move past the fear, I recognized that I could get a better 
grip on what was going on with me than having someone tell me from their uh, scientific point of view what was happening to me. It took me a long time. That didn't happen very fast. It happened over decades, actually. So this is my perspective. You don't have to accept it. I'm not here to convince you that what I'm telling you is real, that I have no interest in that. I'm not trying to win anybody over. I'm just trying to offer up solutions if you're struggling with this, and I'm just offering you a different way of looking at it, maybe. So I'm going to make two assumptions. I'm going to assume that everyone in this room probably is comfortable with the idea that we are not alone in the universe, in the multiverse. In this crowd, a UFO conference, I think that's pretty safe. So I'm going to make that assumption. The next assumption is that I'm going to consider everyone to not think it very weird that I have communication with these beings. That's a little bit more of a stretch, I know. But the communication is available to all of us if we can move past our fear. And if we're open to it and accepting and willing to, to have communication, they're ready to communicate with us. That's where disclosure is going to come, is through that. But it's going to sneak in through the back door that way, in my opinion. So those, those are the assumptions that I'm making. So there are people out there who still have trouble believing that we are not all there is in the universe. As vast as this creation is, there are those who believe that we are it. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that, if I can remember how to do this. Yeah, I'm using the uh, spectrum of light, but actually our scientists have said that there is a spectrum of life. There's a spectrum of life that exists, and of that spectrum of life, we on this planet, as a third dimensional slash now four dimensional being, are aware of how much of that spectrum of life. With our limited five senses, we are aware of less than 1% of the life that exists. So that means 99% of life that is going on around us, we're not aware of. So right now in this room, we all have our angels and our guides with us. I have my ETs with me, I have my guide George. If you're psychic at all, you can see George standing back here behind me. After, the, after I speak like this, I always get people coming up freaked out because they saw little ETs running around with me and, and my guy standing back here. So there's life. We're multidimensional beings and there are worlds within worlds. We are energy. Our world is holographic. And that's the truth of it. So it's not that hard to understand then that we can have these experiences if we can just access a little higher frequency. You want to go higher, you don't want to go lower. <laughs> you want to go to a higher frequency. So the alien abduction phenomenon is a, strange, is a strange subject. And that's one of the first things that I learned after given that label back in 1989, I guess it was. The Center for UFO Studies regressed me to investigate two hours of missing time. And after quite a while of interviewing a lot of witnesses and talking to people and checking on things, they declared me an alien abductee. And that didn't feel so good. It meant that I was a victim. It meant that I was being taken by beings from another world against my will and I was having things done to me that I did not approve of. And it was very difficult to come to grips with that. If any of you have had those experiences, you understand what I'm talking about. You, your mind rejects the whole thing. We're not raised to believe in anything along that line at all. So I struggled a lot with it. In 1987, my community had a flat. I'll just briefly say to those of you who don't know my story, 1987, we had a UFO flat. It was the hot spot in the world at that time, and it went on for, for a couple of weeks. 
In truth, my visits during that time went on for about close to two years. During that time, the Center for UFO Studies, we, they found me and they regressed me. Stanley Mitchell did a fabulous job of taking me back and reliving the two hours of missing time I had when I was 17. It was all by design that this happened because it was time for me to wake up to my experiences. And I didn't know it then, but at that time, all I saw was somebody threw a grenade into my life and blew it all to pieces. Everything came undone for me, and my life was never the same after. It took me a long time to come to terms with it. The hardest part of the whole thing for me was the idea of being a victim. It just, it did not resonate with me. I was told over and over again by the investigators I was, I was being abducted and how terrible it was to have that happen to me. And then it was happening to my daughter, which made it even worse to see your child deal with that. And I saw her as a victim. All the energy around it was, it was, it was horrible. And I was angry. I was angry with them. I was angry at life. I was angry at God for allowing this to happen. It took me probably, that was 87, 89 when I was regressed, so it took me probably close to three decades before I made a realization that you can't be a victim. In honesty, we can't be victims. There can't be a perpetrator if there's not a victim. It's the same energy. So that was an eye-opening revelation for me to realize that because it took the sting out of it and it changed the whole perspective of what I was experiencing. Anyone who is being abducted or anyone in life who feels that they're a victim has to claim responsibility for it because the truth of it is, is that we are energy. That's our true nature. We are energy. Our bodies, our world, is a, it's a holographic world that we live in. We're just projecting, and because we share the same mind and we are one with our Creator, we share the same mind and we agree on this experience that we're having. Agreement means that you can't be victimized, no matter what it is. There is something in you that is attracting that to you. You have agreed to it on a soul level to play this role of victim or to be the perpetrator. I got that. I finally got that and I finally understood it. And it changed everything. And it meant instead of being an abductee, it meant that I was a volunteer. That's how it changed for me. At first, I called myself a participant in a program because that's the way it was put to me. I asked my guys, why are you taking me so much? Why are you here so much? Why can't you leave me alone? And they pulled back the curtain and they showed me that I had literally raised my hand and volunteered to come here. I had stepped forward to come onto planet Earth. Many of you that I'm talking to today are volunteers also. We all have a reason for being here. We all planned out our life. We all chose to come here, offered whatever reason we might have, but it's all to have this experience of this three-dimensional world. But at this particular time, we all chose to come to be here, most likely to participate in the shift that's happening on the planet. My guys call it the Earth Changes. So, in 1945, when the atomic bomb was detonated, that was it. That was a game changer. Planet Earth, which had been languishing as a fear-based planet for so long, in a three-dimensional status and not been able to move up the ladder, so to say, her planet, Gaia, 
our planet decided that she was going to move ahead. Because if she didn't, she was going to be destroyed by her children. Things had gotten out of control. So it was the linear year of 1947 when the plan was put together that Earth would be flooded with higher frequency beings who would come from the higher dimensions and just through their very state of being here, that frequency would help to raise the planet's vibration. They asked for volunteers to come in in waves to help bring about a change and try to get humanity to awaken to the truth of who they are and to stop living in fear. It was a, it was a daunting mission because the odds were not great. In 1947, when the call went out for volunteers and I volunteered, very few of the humans on planet Earth were ready to go into the fifth dimension, which is where Gaia is going, has gone. So to come onto the planet knowing that there was a high rate of failure, probable failure, was, was a little bit daunting, but the more of us who volunteered, the, the more likely our chances were. And the baby boomers, that's, that's why there are the baby boomers, so many of us that came in. The first wave came in in 1949, 1950. I chose the um, life stream. I brought my life stream in on the energy wave of uh, December 25th, 1950. That energy wave gave me the tools that I needed and the gifts that I needed to carry out what I believed would be important to my mission of being here. The reason that we wanted to come is because as Gaia would move into the fifth dimension, she would have to cleanse her body of her children if they did not resonate with that higher frequency. You know, we resonate with the planet. Our frequency resonates with the planet. And if she's going to go to a higher frequency, we need to go with her. To do otherwise is to, it, it's not possible actually. So we came onto the planet to try to awaken the souls that are on the planet, <coughs> try to free you from the prison, from the powers that be. It's a prison planet. You don't live freely. If you heard Richard Dolan talk yesterday, he made a pretty good case of it. And we do have controllers. It's a hard thing to convince people who live on a prison planet that they're in prison. They don't realize they're in prison. They think that they are living a normal life. It seems normal because we're indoctrinated into it from the time we're little. We're taught what to believe. We're not given freedom to express ourselves. Our free will is used against us. And our, the teachers who have come here before to try to enlighten and help guide and show the way, their very teachings were used against them and it was changed. I always like to, I use the example of Jesus, Joshua, his teachings coming onto the planet, allowing himself to be put to death so that he could rise from the dead and show us you're not a body, you're an eternal being. But unfortunately what happened is religion got a hold of the cross and beat us upside the head with it, made us feel guilty, told us we were sinful from the time we were born. Just being born on this planet is enough to make you sinful. Don't have to do anything wrong. Innocent child is born, it's born in sin. It's not the way that it is. So it's an imprisoned planet. You've been trapped in a cycle of reincarnation and karma. 
It's a game that was put in place to keep you here, to keep you from moving up the ladder of life. And some of the souls on this planet have been here for a long time, trapped. Enlightenment was available to only a few. Those spiritual teachers who came on to try to show us our way home, they knew the answers, but you can't convey that to people who... What they'll do is they, they, they worship. You, that's the tendency. When you believe you're small and helpless and a victim, you tend to worship those that come to try to awaken you. So, reincarnation is a game where when you die, because you have short little lives on this planet, you only live about 70 or 80 years, maybe 90, and that's a short time in comparison to other planets. And you don't really leave the planet. You just recycle and come back into another body. And what's worse is you're told that you didn't do something right, that you have to correct something, you have to learn something. And that's the karma game. Now, karma exists in the universe because it's a law of nature that as energy, if there's negative energy, there needs to be a balance. Energy needs to be balanced. So it's balancing of energy. But the way that it evolved on planet Earth is that karma was used as punishment. You did something wrong. You got to go back and correct it. You have to get this right. You have to learn a lesson. And that's not actually the truth of it. What really needs to happen is we just need to wake up and remember who we are. We are one with our creator. We are the creator. We have powers beyond our comprehension. But because we've been made to believe we're little and we've bought into it and allowed ourselves to be imprisoned, we, don't, we can't tap into that. So it's been a game. But what we are is we are God playing in creation. God made the decision to know himself as other, as something other than peace, love, light, joy. God wanted to know what it was like to have fear, to have contrast, to know what it felt like to be something other than in complete peace. It's gone on a little bit longer than what was intended, and it's fallen a little bit further into darkness. It's gotten a little uglier than what it should have, maybe, but it is what it is. And we all came here to experience this state of otherness. The thing is, is once you come onto planet Earth, your soul can get stuck here. It's not easy to get out. What's happening now with Gaia's intention to move into the fifth dimension is there is an opening that's occurring. It has occurred in 2012 started before that, but that was the peak of it, and we have actually accessed a different timeline, a different reality. <coughs> so, our reality in this world is a hologram. We are holograms, even Einstein said it. Reality is merely an illusion, albeit a very persistent one. And it is. As we sit here and I tell you that you're not really a body, that's pretty hard to believe because we look and our eyes tell us, yes, we are. And I see all these other bodies that are separate from me. <clears throat> it's an illusion. It's not real. We are an idea in the mind of God. And as an idea in the mind of God, we are one. When they talk about the ETs, having a beehive mentality that scares us. We don't like the idea that we don't have any private thoughts. I remember being in a dimension where we shared the same mind. And I can tell you it's much, much, much better than being in a dimension where you think you're a singular, individualized body and person, and you're all alone in this world. Being part of unity consciousness is the best. 
You're aligned with the mind of God. You're aligned with the mind of the Creator. It's, it's a trip. It's the best place to be. This being singular and being solitary is kind of a lonely experience. I could go talk about that for a long time, but I won't get off on that. But all the ways that we try to find companionship and love and understanding and someone who really, really knows us and still accepts us and all that is just our, our way of trying to make our way back to unity consciousness, back to oneness. We miss it. We know on some deep level that that's who we truly are and that's who we were created to be. So, <clears throat> it's my opinion that the investigators and those who are studying the UFO phenomenon, I think we're headed in the right direction lately because I've been coming to UFO conferences on and off since the 1990s and looking for answers originally and then later on just as curiosity. And I see a shift happening and it really pleases me to see that the investigators are moving a little bit further away from the nuts and bolts and moving a little bit more into spirituality. Because until we do that, they're not going to get answers that satisfy them they're going to be frustrated because it's not going to make sense to them. We live in what is now, I'm experiencing, most of you are probably experiencing it as a fourth dimensional world. My guys that I interact with, my ETs, come from sixth and seventh dimensions. When you move up this ladder of life, by the time you get to the sixth dimension, you're no longer in form. You're in an etheric body. Seventh dimension, you're a light body. You do not have form. The third and fourth dimensions are dimensions of time, space. Time and space are an illusion. They're part of the illusion. So you have beings who come from a sixth or seventh dimension they're etheric beings, they don't have a body, they don't live in time or space. We're down here in this third, fourth dimension trying to figure out something that we can't even comprehend because it's beyond our ability to understand what it's like to be in a, in a state of timelessness and to be able to communicate and be without form. So to try to study that, our scientists trying to study and understand that, they're going to, it's, no wonder it gets so frustrating for them. It doesn't, it's not going to make sense. You have to look at it from a higher perspective. You have to be up here, looking at it from the perspective of, I am an eternal being. I am here having this experience in a body, in form, but the truth of who I am is not contained within this body. This body is the least of what I am, and it really has nothing to do with it. But we're very enamored with the body, and we're very enamored with our illusion, our life, the things that are important to us, making money and all, this, all the trappings of the illusionary world. So we have to look at the bigger picture and blend science and spirituality, and I'm happy to see that that's happening. And it's just time. So, the esoteric nature of being a volunteer, I don't want to get off track on that, I want to share with you why I came here. When I volunteered, I volunteered to be part of the hybrid program. The reason that that was important to participate in is because at that time, in 1950, as I stated before, most of the Earth humans were going to be washed off the planet. Very few were going to survive. And so we were going to lose the biological entity that we knew as the Earth human. We didn't want to lose that. It was an evolutionary miracle. And so 
I volunteered to come in and have them harvest my ova so that they could continue to have human DNA and have humans. My hybrid children, I have 46 of them, many of them are totally human-human. Now, we all have DNA from the stars in us. We came from the stars. So we all have that within us. So it's interesting, people, I know that, you know, some people get upset that the ETs are mixing human DNA with, with the ET DNA. But it's kind of amusing because it's too late. I mean, there's no such thing as a purebred human. I mean, you know, where did, where did we come from? We came from the stars to begin with. So the guys that I work with, that's what they do. They oversee the planet. They oversee the human entity. And they, they mix some of their DNA with human DNA, just because. And if my children are any example of it, they're doing a pretty fine job. Because they're beautiful, beautiful people with high vibration and very loving, kind, amazing individuals. So when I made the decision to come onto planet Earth, it was a conscious decision on my part. My soul family did not want me to come. They thought I was crazy. I come from a little less than mid-sixth dimension world, a different universe, and they were opposed to my doing this. But I wanted the experience. Everybody knows about planet Earth. It's one of those planets that everybody just knows. And they knew, and I knew, about the plight of humanity on planet Earth and what they had gone through and how they had become trapped and enslaved on their own planet and were trying to find their way out. But always the controllers would shut them down. A sad story. My heart went out to them. And it was going to be sadder still if the souls on planet Earth were going to be washed away when Gaia moved into the fifth dimension. The souls could go to a different planet, another three-dimensional planet, and continue on with their experiences. That's certainly true. But there were also those who had fallen so far into the, into the illusion and into the darkness that chances are they were going to have to go back to, Ga or to uh, Source and be what they call, my guys call, recalibrated. And nobody wants that to happen. It's a long journey to evolve, and it's a great journey, but nobody wants to be abruptly, have their journey abruptly ended and have to start all over again. So I decided to come here, along with millions of others, and when I made the decision, I said, I'm not going to that great planet called Earth and ride the teacups. I'm not doing it. I'm riding the biggest and the baddest <laughs> roller coaster I can find. I should have been listening a little bit more to my <laughs> soul. <laughs> yeah. So I did. I mapped out my life and I put a lot in there. I squeezed a lot into my life. I wanted to climb the mountains. And I wasn't going to climb back down them. I was going to fall off of them. And that's what I've done. It's, my life has been pretty surreal. Amazing journey. We all plan our lives, but you see, I've got just this one. Because planet Earth is going into the fifth dimension. You can always come back and access a different timeline, I suppose. But the truth of it is, is planet Earth is moving out of, she's moved out of the third dimension through the fourth, and now we're headed pretty quickly to the fifth. And that's a timeline anyone has the ability to access and should. So I set up my live stream, the frequencies that I came in on December 25th, and I chose my parents, my family, and I did all that 
with clear rec recognition of the gifts that I would need, the strengths and the weaknesses I would have to do the job I came here to do. So I'm wired to do this. I'm wired to talk about ETs, and I'm t wired to talk about my encounters. I have no shame. I would just talk about it to anybody, and if they don't accept it, I don't care. I'm not intimidated. And I think that that's a trademark of the people who came here as volunteers. We have a tendency to be pretty fearless. It isn't that I wasn't afraid at first with the ET experiences. I did have that, definitely. But as you come more and more into it and you embrace the truth of who you are, you become fearless because you remember that you are not a body and you remember that you are an eternal being and it all comes home to you, the truth of your true identity, your true nature. So I came in without any free will, basically. We all plan our lives. We set out, it's like a road map, like you want to go from Denver to San Francisco in this lifetime, and you have a road map of how you're going to get there and the experiences you want to have along the way. And you have little side trips. You can always have free will to take side trips and experience this and then come back just so you get to San Francisco. That's the idea. And then you have exit points along the way. We all set up our own exit points in case you decide you want to leave. So I set up my road map, but I didn't put in hardly any deviation. My life has been controlled. Mm, I don't know if that's the right word. It's been overseen by my guys and my higher self. And I didn't get a choice on anything. I didn't get a choice on who I married. I didn't get a choice on where I lived. I don't get a choice on my career. I didn't get a choice on anything. I have an angel who actually literally dictates to me who my next relationship is going to be with. And she doesn't take no for an answer. I have been told where I'm going to live. I've been told what I will do. It's not a, like I'm being controlled by them. This is, I come from oneness. I, I understand that this is not someone else doing this to me. I am in complete agreement with this. And I'm allowing myself to be so-called controlled. That's really a bad word. But I'm allowing my life to be run to such a, minor, you know, a minute detail by my guys and my higher self because that's what I'm here for. And as a volunteer, there's different levels of volunteers. You've got some volunteers who came in that are what you would call frequency holders. And they're here just to lend their high frequency to the planet. And that's fantastic. That's enough. There are those of us who wanted to do more. And so I volunteered for this role to write the book and to talk about my contact with the ETs. I was born not caring what people think of me, which is an unusual attribute, I guess. I take it. I see that when I look out on the world. I see it in my own children. They judge themselves and judge their value and their worth by what others think of them. I experienced a little bit of that when I was about, I think I was 15 or 16, and I had a crush on an older, other, older guy, upperclassman, and I really wanted his attention and I wanted him to like me. That's my taste of what that felt like to, have, to try to get somebody's approval. I didn't like that at all. It totally leaves you powerless. And so I'm grateful that I was smart enough to bring that gift in with me because it doesn't matter to me what anyone thinks. I don't need approval to be okay, which is a good thing to have if you're going to talk publicly about <laughs> yeah, and write a book. Yeah, no wonder my children are so ashamed. So, <laughs> God. 
So the other thing about being on planet Earth is、um, the emotions. Planet Earth. That's another thing that's misunderstood about the ETs. On planet Earth, you have emotions, which is great. I mean, it's very it, it's very colorful. Is the word I would use. Emotions are very colorful.、Um, we don't have those in other worlds necessarily, especially when you get up beyond the fifth and sixth dimension. Because once you get into the fifth and sixth dimension. You embody the truth of who you are, and you are love. And that's what my guys are. They're love. They don't show an emotion of love. That's a different thing. Emotion comes from fear. Your emotions come from the idea that you might lose this person. So I love them so much, and I want to own them. I want to control them. I want to make them stay with me. They look good next to me, and. That's that comes from fear. In the higher dimensions, you don't really have emotions, but you have a state of being that it just resonates very deeply as peace, love, joy. My guys have a wicked sense of humor, best sense of humor ever. But there's no malice in it. There's no. There's never any hurt in it. They just are love. So, again, our investigators. You know, they look at that and they think that the ETs, there's something wrong with them because they don't have these emotions. It's, I wouldn't say it's the other way around. It's just different. Not good, bad, or anything. It's just different. In this world, in this dimension of duality, you have emotions. It's just interesting to experience. So I came in wanting to experience that. I had never、uh, experienced. Contrast before I'd only experienced pure light and love, so it was a strange place for me to be. Very strange. My sister and my very closest friend, I truly believe, are angels who came to support me. They have both done their best to try to explain to me how it is to be human, and this was before they even knew about this whole abduction thing. I wasn't very good at it. I was honest to the point of I didn't know that people didn't want you to be honest. <laughs> I yeah, I mean they don't. And I remember being as a child. I remember observing my mother and her sisters and family members, and I saw that they had masks on. I knew my mother when she was saying what she was saying. I was like, why is she saying that? That's not true. You know, I mean, she wasn't blatantly lying, but she was representing a happiness and a fake joy, or something, or something. It was false, and I could see the falseness in all of it. I didn't get it. I wouldn't play like that, so I just was honest. And then I found out you can't—you really can't do that here. And people don't really—they don't. It's not good to be totally honest. I had to learn to play the game, and I'm still trying to learn how to do that. So I'm going to talk about my life a little bit. Give some stories, because that's the esoteric nature of being a volunteer. It are the things that I have to deal with as a volunteer, and maybe some of you can relate to that as well. So, like I said, I have this angel who tells me who I will date and. When my next relationship will start, and I mean, she just totally controls that part of my life. I chose to be single. My husband and I came undone during the UFO flap thing after I was、um, after I was regressed, and it was just too much for him to deal with. And it was just time. It was just time for us to go our separate ways, and so we did. So I've been single since I think 1990 or 91. So most of my adult life. And I'm grateful for that. It worked well for me because I was able to. I'm kind of the、um, feet on the ground kind of a. It's like being a soldier and having a camera on you, and headquarters gets to see everything you see behind enemy lines. Only it's not really the enemy, but we're very we're very intrigued and fascinated by the human species and all the stuff that goes with it. So I allowed myself to kind of. Have 
have um, a series of relationships so that we could study love and the different facets of love. So I went through relationships two or three years at a time, and each one was a stepping stone to the next one. During this period of time, my guys observed, but they did not <coughs> come and pick me up, at least not that I was allowed to remember. So I had 20 years without their, their coming to visit me. So my latest relationship started about three years ago. And the way it went down is that I had come back from Arizona after spending the winter down there. I had ended the relationship I'd had for three, almost close to three years with a man from Arizona and just wanted to be alone. Came back to Wisconsin and was making plans to go out. I'd made plans to go out dancing with my girlfriend and I'm getting ready and my angel pipes up and says, your next relationship is starting. And I said, nuh -uh. No, I need a break. <laughs> I want some downtime. I want to be alone because I, the recession had gone through and wiped me out. I was, my life was cleared of everything. And I just, the emptiness felt kind of good. And I just wanted to be alone. And she just giggled. So I went to text my girlfriend and I texted her and said, what time were you thinking of picking me up? And she texted back and said, well, I'm bringing my boyfriend with and we'll be there at 2 o'clock or whatever it was. And so I went to text her back and say, three's a crowd, I'm not going, okay, have fun. And do you think I could get that phone and my thumb to work? I couldn't get it to work. And I threw the phone down and I said, fine, that's fine, I'll go. If I'm not, not, not meeting anybody, no way. And so I'm getting ready and putting my dancing shoes on. I'm lacing them up. And I'm bent down, strapping them on. And she goes, dear. And I said, what? And she said, don't you think you should put that picture of you and your former beau away? It might not make a very good impression on this new man you're bringing home. And I said, <laughs> I said, first of all, I don't care. Second of all, I'm not bringing anybody home. What do you think I am? And she just giggled. So I finished getting ready, and I'm kind of steaming by now, and I go to go out the door to wait for my girlfriend. I open the door, and she does it again. She goes, dear. That's what she calls me. She has a lot of nerve. And by the way, I know she's not an angel. She's an ET. She's not fooling anybody. <laughs> she, so she goes, dear. And I said, now what? And she said, why well, you think your house is a little messy? It might not make the best impression. And I, was like, I turned and looked, and there were a couple papers on the floor and something on the counter, and I said, it's fine. And I said, and I told you, I'm not bringing anybody home. So I go with my girlfriend. My favorite band is playing up on a, at a bar. It's a pier bar, and out, it's on the lake. So it's outside, 4th of July weekend. And I walk onto the pier, <laughs> and we're there early because we want to make sure we get a good table. We're going to have lunch first. And we w I walk onto the pier, and as I walk up across the pier, I see this guy sitting there, and he turns and he looks at me, and I go, oh, crap. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's so cute. <laughs> I'm like, eh, that's him. So there you have it. <sighs> and he did take me home that night. <laughs> uh, you can only rebel so much, you know. So there I am in a new relationship, and it's um, right as my book is about ready to go to press, the book about the, my UFO experiences. During many of my relationships, I never had to even mention that I had this in my life. Um, it was, you know, I used my own discretion. Sometimes I did and sometimes I didn't. Sometimes I was forced to, like the time that I woke up in the middle of the night and the guy had a vacuum cleaner that was recharging and it had a blue light, and that blue light was coming out from under the closet door and I 
start screaming, they're here, they're here, you have to protect me, save me, hide me. I had to explain that one. So, yeah. so anyway, so I'm in this new relationship with Jim, and I know I have to tell him about my experiences. I mean, I just have to. And the book is coming out, and we're spending more and more time together. So I don't know how long we were together, you know, three weeks or a month. And it just couldn't wait. I, I sent out a little feeler at lunch one day when I said something about, you know, I saw a UFO once. And he's like, uh, grunt it, kind of. <laughs> I was like, okay. So this is not going to go well. So I chose my time carefully. Middle of the night in the dark while we lay in bed. I didn't want to see his face when I told him. So I said, so um, I wrote a book. And he said, you did? And I said, yeah, it's going to be published soon. And he said, really? And those dreaded, you know, the dreaded words, what's it all about? What's it about? I tried lying to somebody once about it, and you can't do that. You try to shroud it and say, well, it's a spiritual book, but that's not it either. And I mean, I just, you just have to say it. And once you say the words alien abduction, you can't bring them back. <laughs> you can't. I tried once, I said it to somebody once, and the look on their face, and I said, I don't know where that came from. Ali Did I say alien abduction? <laughs> uh, they're going to find out eventually anyway. So I just told him, and he took it really well because he's a smart guy and he's inquisitive. And we stayed up a good share of the night talking about it, and he didn't run till morning. <laughs> <laughs> then he ran. Who could blame him? Um, after he left, I turned to my dog and I said, well, Pookie, I think that's the last we saw him. <laughs> Don't think he'll be back. But then I thought about my angels and how they had campaigned so hard for me to be with them. And I thought, well, there must be more to this, but we'll see if it's meant to be, it will. If it's not, that's okay. I guess I'll accept whatever. But he sent me a beautiful email, a card, a couple days later. And in it, he said, you know, who am I to judge? Just because I don't know about this subject, I can't judge you. And then he said, I have a feeling you can teach me things I don't even know I don't know. Yeah, that sealed the deal for me. Okay, so, so we've been together ever since. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm tired. <laughs> Too old. <laughs> so, um, it was good because then things started happening. You know, my guys had, I'd been active with my guys. I was in a period of high activity and they'd been keeping a low profile. So they were, it's like they were relieved and they came on full force and he was aware. He started being aware that I was having these meetings at night or that I was leaving and that um, contact was happening with me. There was one night when I went with my guys. I don't do it as much anymore physically, but I went with them physically because I just, I love to. And um, I went with them and was gone for a couple hours. And when I came back, I was cold. And I crawled into bed and they must have wanted this to happen because otherwise they keep you in a really stupor and him in a stupor. Because when I crawled into bed and I cuddled up next to him to get warm, I woke him up. And he got up out of bed, goes stumbling off to the bathroom, but instead, something caught his eye out the front window. And so he went over to the window and I heard him say, holy crap, what is that? <laughs> I was smiling because I knew what it was. And um, he said, Sherry, come and look at this. Your neighbors have the brightest damn lights I've ever seen. That can't be legal. How can they have such bright lights? looks like a goddamn runway out there. <laughs> and I'm just laying in bed chuckling. I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. And he's out there, you know, I, he's just mumbling on about it. And then finally, you know, he comes back to bed. In the morning, when we get up, I say, so show me where, which neighbor, which house? Because I live in the country, you know, my nearest neighbor's a ways away. I mean, it's a country development, so there, a, there are houses around me, three or four of them you can see. And I said, tell me which one it is. And he went to the front window, 
And you're like, huh. And then he trudged over there, and then he trudged back and back and forth. He went, and then he went into the library, and he said, I wasn't in the library. And then he came back, and he said, I don't know. I swear it was right there. And I'm just standing there watching him do all this, knowing, waiting for it. I'm like, wait for it, wait for it. And he goes, wait a minute. That was no house, was it? I said, no. <laughs> I said, that was my guys. I said, right, isn't it? And he's like, I saw a UFO. And I said, yeah, you sure did. And it is, it's very, very bright when they park out there like that and um, have their lights on. So he wanted to know, after that, he said, well, why can't I go with? Can't I, can't I meet them? And I said, well, I don't know. I'll ask. I had quit asking. My guys have shown themselves to over a dozen of my closest friends and acquaintances, well, friends. I've asked them. At my request, they have shown themselves. They said they do that to give me peace of mind and to give me comfort. And they did it quite a bit. The last one I asked, when I asked them to show themselves, my guy, Da, he said, Sherry, do you think me no more than a circus act that you can parade out in front of family and friends as entertainment? And I was like, oh yeah, he's probably got better things to do. So I quit asking. Anybody who asked, I always said, I'm sorry, they don't do that anymore. But with Jim, I went to them and I said, can he come with sometime? Can he meet you? And Da said, not now. He's not ready. Perhaps later. And I said, okay. And so we kind of forgot about it. And then three weeks later, I went out dancing with a girlfriend and Jim had a game to referee. He does refereeing for high school football. And he was driving from that place, that community, to my house. And he had um, a meet and greet. <laughs> they picked him up. When I came in the door, he was sitting in the dark in my house, and I turned on the light, and I could see something was wrong. And he was trying to figure out what had happened to him. It's that same thing for any of us who have had the experience or know of it. There's that complete feeling of bewilderment, confusion, things you can't connect the dots. He didn't know how he got to my house. He only knew that he turned in from the opposite direction that he should have been coming in on. So I talked to him for a while, and he kept talking about these he kept talking about these giant green, lime green deer eyes. And I didn't even say, do deer have green eyes? And are they that big? He just kept talking about how big these deer eyes were. He was sure they were deer. Then the next morning when we got up and talked, he said, that can't be deer. He was starting to think more clearly. So we hashed it over a lot, and we were very careful. I didn't want to jump to any conclusions, especially the green eye thing. My guys don't have green eyes. And so I was a little concerned about that. And um, so we got a map out, and we looked at the, path, at the route that he, he took, and um, where he remembered seeing the green eyes, and then where he remembered all of a sudden be driving in his car, and he was way on the other side of, he was miles away. He had to put on his GPS to find my house. So he, definitely had lost time and a high level of confusion about the whole incident. But he remembered the last road that he saw before he saw the green eyes. I mean, it was all done by, it was all very well orchestrated. They wanted him to know that he'd had a meet and greet. And sure enough, when we were sitting there talking, and I said, you know what, I think you had an encounter. And as soon as I said that, they said to me, we did a meet and greet. I never heard him call it that before. And I said, okay, they just told me you did a meet and greet. And he said, what? And I said, you met the guys. And he said, really? At this time, I thought it was my guys. And um, he said, well, what did they want? And then they said, indoctrination. And I said, oh, they told me they did an indoctrination. And we both said, what does that mean? I mean, we know what it means. But you always like, what does that mean? You want deep more? And they said, look it up. They say that a lot. And so I, we looked it up, and when you do that, and they do do that a lot to me, they give me a single word or a phrase or something, and they'll say, look it up. And when I go to look it up, the, the meaning that they want me to look at and focus on is always in bold. 
I see it in bold. And the one that I saw was to train to accept the system of thought uncritically. They wanted him to understand what I was dealing with and what I was going through, and they just wanted to bring him on board, I guess. So then they showed me his encounter. And again, it's like a movie running in your mind. And they showed me from up high, and his car was turned the wrong direction, and it was up against the guardrail. So the driver's side door opened up against the guardrail. And I could clearly see there were three guys there that came over. And as they went to open the door, they didn't even have to. He opened the door and he got out willingly. And there was no fear, which is what I was mostly concerned about. He had no fear. It was not traumatizing for him at all. And then they showed me it a second time. And when I watched it the second time, I was like, wait a minute. That's not Da, that's not my guys. That's, they look altogether different. And I looked close, but it went, it went by so fast. And I thought, oh my gosh, I think that was the Dracos. That's the Draconians. And it fit with the green eyes, the description of the green eyes, because my guys have black eyes, or normal human eyes. And um, I got really concerned. I thought, oh no, what have I gotten him into? And they showed it to me again, then a third time. And again, I focused on the little guys that were there, and sure enough, it was the Dracos. And then I, then I really, I didn't tell him that, but I was concerned. They showed it to me a fourth time to emphasize he had no fear. See him willingly get out of the car, there's no fear. And he certainly didn't seem to be traumatized by it or have any kind of trauma to him from the encounter. I first met the Dracos that I recall. I had a meeting with them at my house sometime before this encounter. And I suppose that that was part of what I needed to experience in order to, um, to understand what this was all about. Because I came awake one night about 2 o'clock in the morning came wide awake and aware that there was a presence near my house or in my house. I seemed to know where he was. He was just outside my bedroom area. And so I just threw back the covers and I got up. I walked into my bathroom and I looked out the window, floor to ceiling window that looked out. Um, and under the birch tree in the moonlight was a Draco. And I acknowledged him and he acknowledged me. And then he asked permission to scan me, and I gave him permission to scan me. I was grateful that he asked, because in the past, they, they don't always ask. And I just felt nothing but love for him. I just, I don't know if I had been pre-programmed or what it was, but in all honesty, I felt as much love for that being as I have ever felt for my own child. He just soaked it up like a sponge. And I stood there and I rubbed my arm, I patted my arm, I looked at the clock, I noted that it was, I think, 2.04 or 2.06 or something, and I said to myself, okay, you can stand here for 10 minutes, Sherry, or as long as he's there. I don't know why I didn't go out there or invite him in, but we just, I, we just stood. And I just, I, I think my mission or my job, my role at that time was to just extend love to him. And I just did. And he just, like I say, he was like a sponge. And I, when I think of him, it always makes me happy because he was like a, an innocent little child who was tired of being naughty and he now wanted to change directions. And I believe that a contract was entered into that night or maybe it was before. But when Jim had his encounter with the Dracos, I reflected back on that. I stood there for eight minutes that night, and then I went to bed because I was tired of standing there. I didn't want to do another two minutes. It was getting boring. So <laughs> I, went, I, I went back to bed, and I fell immediately asleep. He was right out my... I have a patio door right by my bed, and I could, if I went over like that, you'd be able to see him. But I just I fell right to sleep. In the morning, I woke up 
very alarmed and upset with myself. And I was pacing my bedroom and going, what did you do, what did you do, what did you do? You went back to bed with a Draco here? Are you crazy? Are you crazy? And I heard Da say, what is it that you fear? And I said, they're low vibrational beings. They're evil, aren't they evil? And he said, you would judge this? I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, aren't they the bad guys? And he said, you, Sherry, you would judge this. And I said, well, okay, no. <laughs> um, and then he said, listen, you long ago surpassed that vibrational frequency. Stand in the truth of who you are. They can't touch you. And those words, stand in the truth of who you are and nothing can touch you, have really served me well a lot as we go through these difficult times. So I reflected back on that when I learned about Jim's encounter with the Dracos and I took strength from it because it's true. It's all about vibration. It's all about the truth of who we are, that we are energy and like energy attracts like energy. And if you have a vibration that is here, then those with vibrations here can't touch you. They can't reach you. They can only look at you. And if you don't fall into fear, you have nothing to be worried about. And that's a good thing to remember, definitely, always to remember and to live by. So I think I'm done. Um, my complete story is in my book, The Forgotten Promise. And um, if you have interest in, in that, I'm going to go downstairs for a little while and uh, man the table, I, something I haven't done all weekend because the speakers here have been fabulous and I've enjoyed it so much, so I have not been down there. But if there are any Q&As, I've got time for questions and answers if you have any questions. I love the Q&As, they're the best part. Uh, yes? What about us born before 1945? Those of you born before 1945? Uh -huh. Well, my understanding is that the program went into effect in linear year 47. So volunteers, you know, the actual volunteers, but I mean, everybody has a purpose for being here. Your soul has a purpose for you being here. And you could have be, you know, be your, not part of that program, but be certainly one who came in to serve and to absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And another conversation that I've heard lately is, is, is there anything significant about RH negative blood? Oh, yeah, I've heard about that too. And I don't know what kind of blood I have. And I think that might have some interest as far as the hybrid program goes. Maybe those, you know, so there could be some actual truth to all that. But it doesn't, it's not the Lipdus test for whether you're a, you've got you know, ET DNA, or if you're mm -hmm. part of the hybrid program is a, is a result of it, so. Okay, and my other thing is Richard Dolan's talk was uh, very um, exciting and interesting and scary. Um, are we gonna move into the sixth and seventh dimension before all that happens? It's a choice that we all have. It's an individual choice that we have as to what we want to experience. Our soul and our higher self have made that decision. If you, they, if you are to awaken, to go into your, it'll be depending on what your frequency is. So there will possibly be those on the planet who are still so much in fear and caught up in that dimension. So their vibration is still stuck there and they will manifest that and that will be their reality. Um, not sure how long the planet is going to survive, in all honesty, that, you know, that timeline, but it's an individual decision as to if you want to evolve, because certainly this is the time to do it. This is a major time of alignment, because like I said, we're energy, and so everything is happening on the level of energy, but we manifest physicality because we're in a physical universe. So we have like the stargate opening. I mean, it is the actual 
physical lineup alignment of the stars and suns with, and suns all lining up to to fulfill that purpose for us to to access the higher dimensions. So it's open to all of us, and because of oneness, we are all one. We will all make it eventually. But there are those who are so entrenched in fear right now that they it's hard for them. But they could be. There's going to be three waves going through into the higher dimension, starting like later this year, supposedly, or right now it's happening for a lot of people. You can tell, you know, if you're one of those that are in the ascension, you know it. You don't have to be told it. And so you're having those experiences, and we're breaking through to create the break through the pattern, the energetic highway for those to follow behind us. So there'll be the second wave. I think it will get easier for people to awaken because of those who go first. So it's an individual choice, though. There are those who may choose on a higher level to stay aligned with fear. They may want to continue that. Thanks okay. so much. Sure. Hey, Alice. So, Sherry, yes. where, where are your beautiful hybrid children? Uh, most, most of them, about a dozen or so of them, I guess it wouldn't be most of them, they're scattered a little bit, but a lot of them are on a small planet that looks a lot like Earth. I don't know where it is. They took me there. A uh, beautiful little planet, and um, they're living very, you know, normal type lives there. Um, some of them are on the ship still. And then, of course, then they have, I don't count them as children, but I have a lot. They have a lot of my, my ova stored for future use if, if needed. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're out there. Not yeah, here. they're not here. No, yep, they're not here. Hi. Hello. Um, first of all, just thank you for being a volunteer. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's yeah. so important for all of us to hear about these kinds of things so that we can all be open to. Well, Dolores started it, you know, I mean, she really opened the door and made it easier for someone like me to step through, so I'm grateful for that. Yeah, yeah. and I really appreciate the um, understanding that, you know, if we're in love, then yes. the ETs that we're going to experience and, and be around it, and, and maybe all ETs, maybe there are no bad guys, maybe they're just... Um, yeah. Wanting to do whatever, interact, figure things out, whatever. But if we're in that vibration, it, um, we can also release our fears because I know that that's something that has kept me back from contact and um, wondering it's if I was fear. Fear. The thing, the way that it is with my guys is that there's absolutely, there's no judgment. So things that we call evil, they just call a lower vibration and they call it an experience. They don't, because they see it for what it is, the fact that if you've got someone evil and they're doing something to this other, supposedly other person, because of oneness, first of all, it makes, it makes that all go away, the idea that this person is doing it to this person. There's no individual, it's oneness. And so it takes that out of it, but it's also the identification that you can't be a victim unless you agree to it on a soul level to have that experience. So it's all about the experience with them. You know, if you want to experience that, you can experience that, they'll say. You want to experience this, you can experience it. You know, and it's all, there's no judgment in it at all. Those who are not going to go with Gaia into the fifth dimension, that's fine. That's fine. They need more time, that's fine. They want more experiences of fear and living in duality, that's fine. You know, they don't judge anything. So I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't say that all ETs are benign. I don't think I'd put it in that, in, in the terms that we use on this planet, we certainly would see them as, you know, in that contrast of good or bad. But the thing that is, is to see it from a higher perspective and understand that if we're going to live on a planet that's a planet of duality, good and bad, get the good guy and the bad guy here, you gotta have somebody who's playing the role of the bad guy. And the souls that volunteer to have that experience are making it possible for us to have the experience of duality. So, you know, it's, everybody just plays their part. It's, it's absolutely no different than playing a, a video game where you take on an avatar and you play that game. It, that's absolutely the way it is on planet Earth. There's no difference. Well, we surely are in a time where we all have a lot of choice and to pay attention yeah. to what works and what 
mm -hmm. can not pay attention to what doesn't. Right, thank right. You. Yeah, thank you. And I just I want to add to that that it doesn't mean that you don't care about planet Earth and what's going on. I'm not advocating that either. When people learn that, you, that the world is an illusionary world and that we're holographic in nature, that doesn't take anything away from the experience that we're having here. You know, I mean, you came here to have the experience of duality and to wake up, to remember the truth of who you are. You fell asleep so you could go through that wonderful process of discovering the truth of who you are. So that's what your higher self, if your life is getting a little bit rocky right now, or it's been rocky, it's because your higher self is tapping you on the shoulder and saying it's time to wake up. And it wants your attention. Time to remember the truth of who you are. Because there is this great opportunity to move very quickly up through the dimensions, and it doesn't come along that often. So, yes. I want to thank you for your courage and your candor. Thank you. You are a breath of fresh air. Oh, thank you. Thank you. For a number of years, I've been studying spirituality as well as the whole UFO ET field. Mm -hmm. And it has always troubled me that in the, I don't know what to call it, the UFO ET field, it is generally accepted that the third dimensional universe has a degree of reality and we're looking at things within that reality. So we have Zetas and which star system did they come from and what's the spaceship shape like yeah. and so forth. Yeah. And that's all in this reality. Yeah. Then you study spirituality and it totally leaves the physical and it starts going fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh dimension. Right. And it never speaks about beings from any place else but Earth. It's just us on Earth going in different dimensions. Exactly. You're the first speaker I've heard who said it's all one. Mm -hmm. That's okay. very refreshing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For those of us here with the awareness that we have, what would your advice be to us to prepare ourselves or to be supportive to the people we meet and care about in terms of evolving in the direction of the fifth dimension? Oh, um, I get asked that a lot. And I will say what my guys taught me, they, they taught me um, the lesson of oneness, which we are all one with our creator. And so you need to live that as they put it to me, it needs to be more than a bumper sticker. It needs to be something that you live every day with every breath. The awareness that we are all connected and that we are all one with source. So you live that and the way you live it is by living through your heart. So, you know, I referenced that this is a planet of duality. The duality is breaking down. That's why things are getting so painful out there. Things always get pretty tough right before the breakthrough whether it's in your own individual life or as a collective. So the collective is experiencing rough times right now with everything that's happening on the planet. And it could get rougher. It, it depends on the collective consciousness. So to answer your question, you have to keep your vibration as high as possible. Individually, you will experience whatever it is that you agree to experience based on the energy that you're putting out because this is a world of projection and perception. So you have a thought, your thought creates the reality and it is reflected back to you. So you wanna keep your thoughts high. You know what I mean by that, right? So you wanna, yeah, so you, so because, okay, so it's projection and perception. So you wanna project out onto the world what? You wanna project through your heart, you wanna project love. Stop judging, stop being critical, stop being in fear, stop worrying, trust, those are all hard things to do, I know, but the truth of it is that you have a choice. I always go, you've got, you got the duality of this world. You've got ego, which is our fear-based little self, which is how the controllers control us. They keep us in fear through the media and through everything that, the false flags and everything that's going on. That's how they keep control of us. They keep us attached to the illusion, to the ego. Step away from the ego, Live in, a, in accordance with your true self, your heart, your connection to source, spirit. So I highly, strongly advocate a prayer of surrender every day. You surrender your free will, which is, I know, a sacred cow. But the truth of it is, is here's the truth of it. You were born, you were created as a divine being. You are the creator, you are God. You don't need any other will than that. Free will means 
I'm going to experience fear. Think about it. The true nature is that you are one with your Creator. Your will is one with your Creator. It can't get any better than that. You have that energy coming through you, choosing, making choices that are for your highest and best good. If you're going to live in free will, what that means is you're going to live according to the ego, which has not got your best interest at heart. It was part of the game of being on planet Earth. But you, you, I would give that up. I would, you do the prayer of surrender, and you say, my will is one with my creators. Show me where you would have me go this day, what you would have me do, the words you would have me speak, and give it over, and then trust. Trust is a big second part of that, because your life is going to change. You do that prayer of surrender, everything that's not serving your highest and best good is going to be changed, or taken away, or altered in some way. And it takes a lot of faith and trust to allow that to happen. And you ride through the waves and through the storm, knowing that you're safe and that it's okay. And that anything that's material, anything that's a form, anything that's part of the illusion, it doesn't matter if it's taken away. I lost everything. And it was the best experience of my life. It was the best experience of my life. I lost everything. And, I mean, relationships, family, children, everything, business, everything. And stripped clean. But when you're stripped clean, you've got nothing to lose and you've got nowhere to, to look but to the Creator and go, okay, what now? Make of me what you will. And my life has turned out to be something I could never have imagined. I wrote a book that got published and is being made into a movie, a movie about my life. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I mean, yeah, it, it, life it, it ebbs and it flows. It, it, things may be washed out of your life, but it's all for your highest and best good when you're living in alignment with spirit. And the things that will wash back into your life are so much better. And it doesn't come down to material. I'm not talking about money. Not necessarily, not that money is evil, but it isn't about that. You learn who you are, and you learn that you're safe, and you have miracles that show up in your life. So, live through your heart, live your highest and best life. Keep your vibration high. Yeah. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.